what is happening down in Austin and how does it get fixed? That's, that's the topic of today's discussion, a topic that I haven't really looked forward to sitting down and recording and trying to just piece together my thoughts and <laughs> delivering them in an accurate way. That's also reasonable because there's so much that I want to say so much to process. If you're watching this video, you already know Texas lost to Kansas this past Saturday night in a way that just feels like what many people have already said is rock bottom for this program throughout its history. So we're going to work through a few things, things that I have written down. This is, this is my message to the fan base, uh, me peacefully just coming and, and, and being honestly vulnerable to lots of different differing opinions out there. Things that, you know, I know it's almost impossible to get an entire fan base to always agree or to, to agree on, on one spe specific topic, much less the topic of how do we solve or go about solving the problem that is, you know, fixing our, our, our program, the, 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 the team that we love, how do you make it better? How do you fix it? I've got a couple thoughts. And first and foremost, I wanted to, to credit Steven from Fanatic Perspective. I thought he, he made a great point. This is now more than ever. It's a time in which the fan base needs to come together and and really, really think very carefully about the things that we're saying, putting into the, the Twitterverse or the social media world, right? Not continuing to pollute the state of the program with more toxicity than, than, than there already is. Um, if, if we see what we see on TV seems like some of the players have quit. I'm not going to sit here and accuse anybody of that because I'm not there uh, first you know, in person. So it's foolish of me as a fan to speculate on which guys have quit, which guys haven't. It looks like a lost football team and it looks like a football team that doesn't know how to win. So I think it's very evident when you see things happening, like what, what happened with obviously the Bo Davis video leak, which by the way, I haven't spoken on yet. I happen to love, I know there was a lot of, of, backing in regards to Bo Davis. Uh, the fan base had his back on that one, and we were all pretty much in agreement there. But the fact that there was a player on that bus in the heat of the moment, you know, the the biggest ass chewing of the of the season or what it, what was at least something similar or close to that, right? You would have to assume why is it, why is your phone out? Why are, why are you recording? Are you, you know, are you looking for clout? Are you looking for an out? Are you, are you trying to, I, you know, I don't, I don't know. I don't know what you're doing. And that, in that particular instance, why your phone is out. I can speak from experience. You know, I've been in a lot of, I've been in multiple division one locker rooms. I've been in multiple professional, uh, professional locker rooms. When you're being addressed by your manager, your coach, your, your, you know, in, anybody within the athletic department, the administration, I can tell you the last thing that you're thinking about is, is having your phone in your hand and what's going on in, in your virtual world. So that's, that's, you know, that's concerning. That's problem number one. Secondly, let me make sure I stay on track here. You know, we, we, we can't obviously cower from this. We can't run from it. It's reality. It's the world we live in. But like I said, I, I think our fan base just really has to come together, show support, be supportive, be positive, um, try to be proactive towards helping solve this problem and not reactive because at the end of the day, we are a major part of this, right? It's It's the number one college brand in America. And that's because of uh, people like us, the fan base, right? <clears throat> There's a lot of passion that has built that, that relevance, that national prominence, that, that brand. But 
at the end of the day, I think I think it's foolish. A, and we'll talk about this. This is going to be one of the main points I try to drive home. Is it a talent issue or is it a culture issue or is it a talent development? And I think the answer is probably a combination of all three. Is it the players? Is it the coaches? You know, it makes us feel good for whatever reason to have one specific thing to just hone in on, decide as, as fans personally that this is the number one thing we're going to blame just because it feels feels good to blame and to pinpoint somebody, have a scapegoat. Issue number one I have with blaming the coaches, while they, they're not innocent, uh, that's going to be the first thing I also want to acknowledge. They are innocent. Like Steve Sarkeesian uh, inexplicably getting conservative in the second halves of football games that allows you to, to blow big leads in, in football games. Uh, using less of the things that built you that lead, like wildcat formations, lots of motion, pre-snap, lots of play action, um, getting the quarterback moving in space, changing platforms, right? That cr offensive creativity, for whatever reason, lacks. And now maybe there's a reason for that. I, I, I will go ahead and get it off top here as well I, i'm 100 percent fully on board with this coaching staff a lot of you that are not new to the show already know that and while we're here if you've listened to this far this deep into to a, a somber video here i, I want to say thank you because uh, you are a big part of like i said this fan base that can help bring this culture back to, to pr national prominence again but um i'll go ahead and do it this way if you're on board with this coaching staff and you, you know, you, you are a believer, go ahead and smash that, that like button. And if you aren't, let me know by hitting the dislike button too. That's uh, we'll do it. We'll do it that way. A little poll just to kind of get a feel for where everybody's at. But I've, I've seen a lot of for and against, and this is just me stating my two cents again, peacefully wanting to discuss as a fan base and hopefully shed some light as an athlete myself, maybe just provide some context to the situation that we're seeing unfold. And then on the other side, too, I just talked about some of the things that are, are somewhat puzzling, troubling from Sark offensively. PK, a lot of people will point to him persistently running a too high safety set, which a lot of times indicates or invites the run a lot more for a defense that has shown no means of stopping it. Um, so welcoming the run game with a three down formation or a three down front with personnel that I don't believe Texas is currently equipped to, to use uh, efficiently. Things like that, right? Those are things that examples that you can point to as a fan and say, that's the coach's fault. That's on this staff. On the other hand, missed tackles, guys not fitting run gaps, run assignments, um, dropped passes. Failure to block, creating a pocket for 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 our quarterbacks. Um, lots of stuff. Recording coaches when they're they're ranting about your your lack of buy-in. That's all on the players. So, my thing is this, and I've seen people point to fire Steve Sarkeesian, fire Pete Kwiatkowski. You're more than welcome to have those opinions. But I do believe that we are entering the realm now of insanity if we continue to believe and convince ourselves that we can point to a scapegoat and just pull the trigger on firing a coach that hasn't even had time to instill a culture yet. We're running into the same exact problem. You cannot have continuity if you don't allow the continuity to build. You can't have a culture without continuity. You're asking 18 to 22 year old young men. And I've, I've been in this situation before, so I can relate to it. Imagine, imagine you're at your job, right? And you're trying to accomplish the same task, but in a four year span, three year span, we'll say you're given 
three completely different, say, softwares or technologies or a means to do so by your boss. He shows up every 12 months. Okay, you're going to do the same job that you've already done your whole life, but you're going to do it my way this time. It's a completely different way. You're, you're having to completely reinvent your, your thought process or the, the, the way in which you go about achieving your task of completing your job, or in this case, football term, winning the game. This is a, a, a football team that doesn't know how to win because they haven't yet. They, they, there's players on this team, upperclassmen, and we'll get to this in just a second. I'm trying to be as efficient as possible here. Upperclassmen, say starting in, in the, the, since the 18 and 19 class, we hear the term attrition that's been thrown around, thrown around on, on Twitter a lot lately. Attrition. 50% of your recruits from the 2018 to 2019 classes are, are gone for reasons of either transferring, medically retiring, or just complete getting com flat out getting cut. I'm not sure what Steve Sarkeesian is supposed to do about that. When, when the bulk of your starters, the guys who are the veterans in the program, the, the third and fourth year guys, 50% of that isn't there. Texas already was bottom, bottom like five or 10% in the country. I think it was actually more than that. They're returning only like 49% of their, their, their production from a year ago. There's a, there's a, there's a significant talent problem on this team. And you might say, well, Lando, how, how can you say that when Texas has all these top recruiting classes, uh, you know, looking in the top five, like dating back to Charlie, the Charlie strong era, there were multiple top five recruiting classes. Tom Herman had one or two. Steve Sarkeesian right now is on pace for, you know, to have a top five class himself. So you say, how, how is there a talent problem? Well, and this is stuff that you guys can go and look at. I've got it pulled up, but I don't want to. I don't want to belabor the point. If you don't believe me, go look it up. There's the talent that makes up those top five classes that Texas has brought in. It's all at the skill positions. And I was too naive as a fan when all this stuff was happening to not catch on and, and understand that. The trench talent, the headline names in these recruiting classes, the trench, all the trench talent are, is not a part of that. It's not making up these top five quote unquote recruiting classes. So, and, and just, just for example, you know, the, the highest ranked offensive line recruit dating back to 2017 that I've just even looked at because those are, those are guys from that class that are still on this roster today. So that's as far as I went back, I'm sure it, continues um, to, to sort of prove the point here. But since 2017, your highest offensive line recruit, Tyler Johnson from the 2019 class, he's three years in and he hasn't even seen the field yet. You know, Tyler Johnson dating back to 2017 is the only recruit on the offensive line or defensive line at Texas, that's not a transfer that has been signed and showed up on campus that has been a top 10 player at his position for his recruiting class. Tyler Johnson was number eight, the number eighth ranked offensive tackle in the country in 2019. He's the only one that's even in the top 10. Every other player that you see that's on the field right now was either way outside the top 10 at his position or well below the 90 overall, like total skill or the, the total rating of, of, of his player. I think Derek Kerstetter was an 86. You know, I think junior Angulau was a, like a 91 or a 92, but still, you know, like outside of the top 100 in, in the class, right? He's the number one, number one player in, in the state of Utah, which is, I think where junior Angulau came from. And I, and I don't, please don't, think that I'm taking shots at the, at the players at all. That's not it. I'm just, I'm, I'm highlighting 
nuances that a lot of people haven't really fully understood. And Nino Nino's corner, I want to give credit to him. He pointed this out, or he broke it down in a way that was much easier to understand. This is something that a lot of us uh, content creators talk about b- behind the scenes. We've we've been hammering home the the skill, position, talent as it relates to the talent in the trenches at Texas. And there's a significant, significant drop off. Texas is tied with KU right now, dating, like I said, once again, back to 2017 with 18 offensive line recruits that have shown up to campus on scholarship. And that doesn't account for transfers or guys that have entered the draft. So in a, and we, we figured out that in a five year span dating back to 2017, Texas, not only are they tied for last with KU at 18, those are, that, was the, that was the technical number, but they've operated that five-year span with only 12 due to, due to guys transferring out outside circumstances. 12 offensive linemen in a five-year span. That's, that's part of your problem, guys. Steve Sarkeesian is handicapped by the offensive line up front and Pete Kwiatkowski is handicapped by his defensive line up front. Now, again, I understand maybe you should make an adjustment. You can point to all that, say whatever you want, but if if you're firing a coach right now, the staff is, the staff is qualified. We have to let a qualified staff do their job. We have to give them the opportunity to build and, and, and really break this down and stop putting band-aids on bullet holes. Firing a firing a, a, a coach just continues to it, it it makes things more and more difficult. You have to be able to recruit recruit players for the system you're trying to run and get them on campus, bulk them up, make them stronger, faster, and sharper between the years, so that they fully understand what's being asked of them and how to achieve their job, their task of, of winning football games. So I just wanted people to also ask themselves this question. Take you back to mid-October at the Cotton Bowl. Texas versus OU, right? Two, two top 15. I think Texas was 15th in the country at the time. They were 4-1. and one. You have a 38-20 to 20 lead. On number five, Oklahoma. In the 18 quarters since then, <laughs> you're four and six. Just think about how how much has changed as a result of that game or since that game. You know, all, all the energy that occurs in that stadium, weird things happen. We understand that, right? It's such it's 50% on one side, 50% on the other. Momentum is crazy. Now that could have been a one-off. But then ask yourself this question. Not just once against OU, but twice against Oklahoma State and against Baylor. Three games in a row. You blow a double-digit lead against the top 15 team in the country. What does that do to you mentally? That's a question I ask myself. I don't know how I would respond to that as a player. You know, you, you, you can see where that would be frustrating. How do you continue to buy in? How do you, how do you move on from that? That's it's, it's scarring. You, you don't, you no longer, you, you start playing not to lose as opposed to playing to win. There's a difference there. Playing scared, playing timid, don't mess up. That kind of that type of mentality, and part of that again is because these guys are they're not sure of what they're being asked to do because they've been asked by three different regimes to do their specific job, their specific role, three different ways. I'll never forget it. Matthew Stafford was on the Manning Cast on Monday night a few weeks back, and they were talking about the adjustment period from Matt Stafford going from Detroit, obviously to LA and 
there, Peyton asked, asked Matt Stafford how the transition was of you know getting the playbook down, learning the playbook, being familiar with Sean McVay's system, and he said, you know, learning the new playbook is 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 the easy part. That's the that's that's fine. I, I've had no trouble with that. He said that's easy. The hard part is forgetting the old one. So just think about that. That's why I can't fully say that this this team has given up, which I you know I'm pretty sure that they have, ninety five percent sure that they have. Otherwise, you know, that's the thing with defense is the offense looked actually pretty good against KU, right? And credit to Casey Thompson, dude's been a warrior, you know, playing with the bum thumb, three hundred and sixty yards, seven touchdowns. He wants it. Xavier Worthy. Dude's a freshman. Leads the country in touchdowns right now. He wants it. Bijan Robinson had no business playing in that game against KU. Goes out there and has like 30 some odd touches. Two touchdowns, I think. Gets hurt. Dislocates his elbow. He's already banged up. He just threw his whole body out on the line for you, for a team that it feels like doesn't have the same fight. So, Roshan Johnson too, man. Dude raised his hand two years ago when there was nobody else to play the running back position. He said, I got you, coach. Whatever you need me to do. Those are the championship character type players that you can build a, a program around. And that type of buy-in, that type of commitment, that type of will is what ultimately will bring this this program back. You know, like depth in the trenches, again, that's what I'm going to keep pointing back to. That's what it all boils down to for me. Cam Dewberry is still out there. Kelvin Banks is still out there. Devin Campbell is still out there. You can go a long way towards rebuilding a program if you go out and get a couple top names in the trenches and change the trajectory. You know, build build top five programs with the big boys and see how that affects your program. Not the skill position guys. The guys that want to be nasty. The guys that want to show up to Austin, get some early playing time if that's your sales pitch, whatever, whatever you got to do. Get them on campus. Drop, show up with a double, duffel bag full of cash. Keep the top trench talent in the state of Texas. In Texas. <coughs> and that's my thing. Um, think about being in a locker room, everything's comfortable, right? Under a previous coaching staff, you like the way that, that it's, it's run. You like the way that the program is ran. New guy shows up, sees the flaws within your program. By the way, if you haven't heard Kirk Herbstreet talk about Steve Sarkeesian and the conversation that he had with him, I would highly recommend you go look that up. It was in the, uh, college football podcast ESPN college football podcast highly recommend it was the most recent one from this past Monday Kirk Herbstreet said that you know in his conversation with Steve Sarkeesian Steve knew he was like look I know I know what's what what's being asked of me at this job I know the magnitude of of the issues and what's expected and I I understand the challenge that is, is in front of me and that's why I respect him so much for willingly taking that on, acknowledging it, but saying to the, to the administration, get ready, hold on for a, a you know, hang on for a bumpy ride because it's going to get ugly for the Cowboys getting blown out by the Broncos. Wake up call, you know. Another thing Steven, Steven said from Fanatic perspective, and I'm sorry if I'm bouncing all the way all around here. 
this team more than ever, along with needing its fans to come together and to have their back, to uplift, right? Not not bash and put down and throw shade. Needs its former players, the Texas X's, right? The greats all come together, you know, be supportive. They've already been outspoken on Twitter, right? But I'm, I'm, I'm talking like put all your heads together, all your all your money together, Create a create a network, a band of brothers, and and you know figure this stuff out. Talk to recruits. Send Vince Young to people's front doors. Send Quandre Diggs to people's front doors. Send Jamal Charles to people's front doors. Send Ricky Williams. You know I, I could name I could name names of all the old greats for for hours right now. But. That's what it takes. You know, I mean, I think if you don't do things differently, then how can you expect any change to happen? You know, to to single out a coach, any one person, whether it be PK, Steve Sarkeesian, Kyle Flood, Jeff Banks, Bo Davis, you name it. To single out any one person is, is to say, to also admit to yourself somehow that that one person is responsible for what we're seeing now. This has been a this is a twelve year ordeal. That's that's just fine. it's all coming to a head now, right? I, I think you saw you 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 saw this program by letting the qualified individuals who are now finally in place the position of positions of power. This coaching staff. Championship resumes, all of them, top to bottom. You know, maybe you could say, say for a couple positions here or there within the coaching staff, right? But it's not just a a, a, a qualified head coach anymore that that deserved the chance, right? Tom Herman, Charlie Strong, maybe they were qualified coaches, but it was not a qualified staff altogether, and. When you don't allow these guys time to fix a problem, you're you're just you're chasing your tail. Eleven years of mediocrity doesn't get solved and and overnight it doesn't happen. So I just want to make sure I'm not missing anything here. I mean, the coaching staff is telling us, you know, PK, Bo Davis, they told us what, what, what they thought about the current state of the depth of our trend of, of our defensive linemen. They signed three edge players immediately from the transfer portal because there wasn't adequate depth or talent on the roster at the time. They had to go get Ovia Gofu. They had to go get Ray Thornton. They had to go get Ben Davis. Why? Because for reasons of either medically retiring, transferring, or just getting injured or not being recruited at all, there there isn't depth at the positions of need on this roster. You've got two walk-ons seeing significant snaps on your defense right now. You tell me. what the problem is. Couple more things here. I think you know somebody ultimately is going to get going to get the can this season. Coaching staff's got to have its own back at the end of the day, right? But I don't know if it's a coincidence. Maybe it is. Maybe it's not. When Steve Sarkeesian mentions the strength and conditioning staff as the first thing that they're going to evaluate when the, when the season is over. Why, why, is, why does Texas seem to be the least physical team on the football field every Saturday? Well, I think we just uncovered that, right? When we, we Maybe it's Yancey McKnight. It was kind of the old school way of being, you know, 
Tom Herman's players were big. They were strong. They weren't always agile and fast. But Torrey Becton has a whole new way of doing things, right? It's more sports-specific, position-specific work. I don't think it's all on Torrey Becton. Being physical is not a physical attribute. It's a mentality. It's a want to. You can be 245 pounds with 6% body fat. But if you don't want to go hit somebody, knock somebody's head off, then what good does that do for you? It's instilling culture. You can't have culture when you have constant turnover, when you're constantly firing head coaches, firing position coaches. Continuity matters. You have to be fully on board with what you're being asked to do before you can do it at 100% speed and 100% effort. Pete Kwiatkowski didn't forget how to coach. Go look up, go look at his tenure in Washington and his tenure in Boy, at Boise State. Texas Homer does a great job of tell, painting that picture for you, telling you the story of how Pete Kwiatkowski was one of the few at the forefront of innovation defensively, creating new positions, new styles of coaching. And putting two-star, three-star players in the NFL in the top two rounds. In five years at the University of Washington, Pete Kwiatkowski had ten times as many day one and two draft picks on the defensive side of the ball as Texas did in that same time span, time frame. Ten times. There were ten total players. I counted. I did the research. I went back and looked. You guys can fact check me or... Or you can just, you know, take my word for what it is. But, you know, I would encourage you to look at that stuff. Resume. I'm not just picking up words that sound cool and backing up this coaching staff for no reason. These coaches are qualified. They put players in the NFL. That's the ultimate goal, right? That's why, that's why kids sign up. You walk into their living room and stand before their families and tell them, I'm going to put you in the NFL. This coaching staff has done that. Pete Kwiatkowski has done that. So there's probably a couple things I'm missing. We're well over, you know, over 30, 30 minutes now. I think that's, that's all I wanted to say. Um, maybe real quickly here, we'll go back and look at some of the names, but just to, to hammer home the, 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 the depth and the talent in the trenches, guys. Starting in 2017. Let's just do it. I want to do it right now. Taquan Graham was your third highest ranked recruit in that class. What did I say earlier? Nobody in the trenches in the top 10 at their position. He was number 15 at his position that year. Ranked 204th nationally. That was Sam Ellinger, Toniel Carter, Taquan Graham, Gary Johnson, Montrell Estelle, Josh Thompson, Reese Latow, Marquez Bimich. You named 10 guys. There's only two that play either offensive line or defensive line. Two out of your top 10. Let's go to 2018. Again, the talent, skill positions. This is the top four class. Number three, actually. The third third overall class in the country that year, 2018. You ready for this? Caden Stearns, B.J. Foster, Jalen Green, DeMarvion Overshone, Brennan Eagles, Anthony Cook, Joshua Moore, Alvante Woodard, Deshaun Jameson, Deli Adele, Keandre Coburn, number 11. The 11th best player in that class was the also 11th best player in that class at his position. That was the top guy you brought in. Everybody else, linebacker, corner, receiver, receiver, corner, receiver, safety, corner, safety, safety. Amazing players. NFL caliber players. Caden Stearns is in there already. Brennan Eagles is on a roster right now. DeMarvion Overshone probably should be. But he didn't have any big boys in front of him to make his job any easier. I can tell you that. We'll see. I think he's a top two round, uh, a top two day talent. You know, between rounds one and three. We'll see how he grades. He kind of just 
plays an odd position, right? Yeah, 27 scholarships available that year. And only one of them inside your top 11 was address, uh, addressing the big boys. Only one. 2019. 26 scholarships. Another number three overall class. And this is where all the fun really begins when you talk about the talent that's that was the Brew McCoy to Gabriel Floyd year, right? Two five-star players Texas is able to lure from California, neither of which played a single snap for your program. To Gabriel Floyd, medically retired due to, due to I think it was concussions, if I'm not mistaken. And Brew McCoy, has, that's a whole fiasco in itself. Not even going to explain that, but we all know what happened there. That was Brew McCoy, Jordan Whittington, Jake Smith, Tyler Johnson. We talked about Tyler Johnson, the highest ranked offensive line recruit dating back to 2017 and probably further. If I go back and look, I just didn't want to do that because no, no player before the 2017 class is still on the roster today, but 2018, 2019, 50% attrition. Those are the guys that are supposed to be leading your program. Now, three years, two to three years down the road. Those are the guys that are seeing significant stat snaps for your program. You don't always want a ton of freshmen out there. Very rarely do they produce at the rate at which Xavier Worthy has done at the rate at which we could have saw, could have seen B. John Robinson do last year. Let's go through it though. 2019 Brew McCoy, Jordan Winnington, Jake Smith, Tyler Johnson, the Gabriel Floyd, Tyler Owens, Kenyatta Watson, Marcus Washington, David Benda, Braden Labrock, Chris Adamora, Darian Brown, Roshan Johnson, Isaiah Hookfin, right there. That's the second guy you see in the trenches in that class. He's 15 guys down the list. Where is all this top talent in the trenches going? It's not in Austin. I can tell you that. 2020. We'll keep, we'll keep going here. Bijan Robinson, Hudson Card, Alfred Collins. There you go. That's a big one. Near five-star player. Finally, you know, again, and even that was slow, seeing, getting him to translate. We get Jaquindon Jackson, who's no longer with the program. Vernon Broughton, so two within the top five. Credit to Tom Herman for finally realize, realizing that. Prince Dorba still hasn't really seen much playing time, if at all. Three within the top six players in that class are in the trenches. And Dorba's really still an outside linebacker to me. I, I wouldn't even consider him a trench guy. But at least they tried to turn him into a pass rusher, right? And then you got Zavin Alford, Keaton Crawford, Jaron Thompson, Jake Majors. Troy O'Meary. Did a, I did a video featuring him, what I think of him as a player. If you want to go check that out, the Lando Show. Troy O'Meary, uh, Texas's forgotten receiver, Jim. Love that kid. Finally, a little bit more of, of, of an attempt to address the trenches in 2020, but still, those are the guys that are only in their second year now. Like they're, they're, they're being asked to, to, to play roles and to cover for experienced players that, you know, in, in, in positions in which they've been familiarized with the system, the coach's system for multiple, multiple years, you might as well consider Vernon Broughton and Alfred Collins still freshmen because they're, they're, they're under a brand new coaching regime now, right? It's not the same. You've got to develop continuity and it starts by not firing coaches just because you want to point the finger at somebody and, and blame them. 2021. I'm trying to be objective here, guys, too. So, again, let's let's bring this fan base together right now. If you've stuck stuck with me this far, hit me in the comments. What, what your thoughts are? What do you think about everything? We, we got to talk through it. We got to figure things out. This is my personal opinion. Um, I would love to know if you agree or disagree. Seriously. Finally, 2021. Jatavion Sanders, Xavier Worthy, J.D. Coffee, Ishmael Ibrahim. Jameer Johnson, DJ Harris, Jordan Thomas, Terrence Cooks, Maurice Blackwell, and Jaden Alexis, the top 12 names. What do we got? Two of those? 
in the trenches. DJ Harris, edge player, and Jordan Thomas. Who I think he was actually one of the later guys that committed, if I'm not mistaken. I I, I don't even know if I think he was like a desperation move because Texas had to had to fill a, a spot on the defensive line because there's just such a they're so devoid of, of, of talent. So I hope that all makes sense, y'all. Uh, this video went way longer than I anticipated. Should have known just because of of, of the, the the touchy subject that it is weighing heavy on my heart lately. Um, I am living my worst sports nightmare right now with the university that I love. <laughs> uh, so I feel vulnerable right now. I know I'll probably get some some people that disagree. Probably probably some people with some strong opinions against me, but that's okay. Uh, would like to encourage you to leave constructive criticism, if at all. <laughs> uh, but please do let me know how you feel. Thank you all for watching. Uh, as always, horns always up. And hopefully we, we give this coaching staff time to figure it out. Because we, we deserve it. It's about that time. So that's all I got.